Yeah, thank you for, uh, for coming. If some of you uh, want to come closer, you can kind of sneak closer. That would uh, be useful. But uh, actually, we're going to turn the lights out and so on, or down. That's probably it. Thank you. So this, this will, um, I promised him I, I wouldn't uh, 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 talk a moment uh, more than three hours. Um, but <laughs> no, he, 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 he's got me on the, the string. So you're going to wave your hand when it gets uh, desperate here. The, uh, uh, this business about, uh, I had a discussion with your director, your name? Inez. Inez. Um, so it's related to the title, what to do, uh, and maybe mostly what not to do. That's that's my uh, what maybe mostly what not to do is is for you to judge, but what to do is a, is a is an important question in schools of architecture, but also within architecture itself. Uh, when the when the spectacle, uh, uh, whether it's a movie, uh, a, 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 a campaign. Uh, for presidency in the United States or, or uh, 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 the Super Bowl or whatever it might be, uh, invades. And it, it always had been part of architecture, to say the least. But uh, when it really invades architecture, uh, it, it, it raises a question. And that invasion within architecture has a lot to do with uh, the environment that's in the world. Uh, there's a book called Architurism, which talks about, you know, cities build buildings. Uh, I was telling Marianne uh, Burkhalter, who is uh, uh, one of my closest friends in the world, except that we haven't seen each other for 12 years, uh, <laughs> uh, that, uh, that, that um, uh, where was I? The, the uh, Calatrava was doing a, a museum in, um, edition in, in Milwaukee, and the budget was 12 the board, uh, we, we were doing a little project in Montessori School there, and uh, our, uh, the, the family we knew well, they had a student who was at CyArk and uh, had graduated, and uh, so the father was on the board. And so he presents the scheme, and then somebody raises their hand and say, it's the budget for the building. What is your estimate? He said, well, uh, probably $45 million. The budget was given to him as $12 million. And they said, well, forget it. It's like we're not doing it. And so he, uh, oh, he's not in the audience. Uh, so he, he said, uh, uh, they said, we can't, uh, we can't afford that. So he said, and he grabbed his papers and said, well. Um, th so that's, uh, that's sort of the, the oops, part of the uh, deal. The last, uh, the, the, then the subtitle is, um, is just uh, I'm going to go through a lot of projects and, and probably not explain any of them. And uh, but I, what you see with your eyes is, you know, what you see is you'll get it. I, I hope. Uh, and we, uh, Marion Ray, my partner uh, in life and also in, in the work, um, is uh, is a big part of this thing. But uh, a number of other people as well. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it, 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 most importantly, the, the New York uh, crew, Keith Goddard, uh, Lester Walker, and Craig Hodgetts. Uh, you, you probably know, don't know Lester, but uh, Craig Hodgetts and Ming Fung practice together, and you, you pro hopefully you know some of their buildings. Uh, so Craig and I practice together up until a certain project, and then, then uh, we went our separate ways. Um, Oops. And well, this is where I'm going to have to. Uh, this is f the, on the right is down in the Yucatan. That that was a, a natural building. What uh, we saw it and uh, notice how the rain it rains and it splashes the mud up on the side of the building. Uh, uh, we claim it's the invention of the wainscot or the the base of a building because that's. Uh, probably none of you know about it. It's not clear whether it's real. 
it, it was a it was an important piece of ar archaeology. Well, yeah, uh, except that they were building a parking lot in Nice, and they discovered some funny stones uh, uh, that uh, it was habitation and uh, terra mata. Does anybody know this? Uh, no, it, it's 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 old. Uh, it's got two columns, two places where you did work, fire, pit, and a place to make tools, and then a, a border around the thing with stones. And they were, they were, there, were, there was more than one of them. Uh, they dated it, and it was 300,000 years. So that's, uh, you can look it up on the, in, in, the, in the magazines, but uh, also uh, there's some people that, th this has been around for about 15 or 20 years. Uh, this is before people can talk to each other. Um, so, uh, I didn't know Bijoy had used these terms, but uh, uh, well, let me, uh, yeah, we'll get to this. Okay, uh, these are the places that we've done work. 33 Union Square West. Where you work is like, uh, uh, is crucial. And, and how you do your work is crucial. I think it comes across in, in Bijoy's, uh, uh, the exhibition. Uh, so Union Square West, Four Rose Avenue is in California. The Howard Hughes Engineering Building, which is also in California, is the first building that Howard Hughes built when they were doing the Spruce Goose. It was a fabulous space. And then now we're down at 1800 Industrial, downtown Los Angeles. CyArk followed and moved down there. This. This is uh, uh, Bijou, either Bijoy's humor and Sam Barkley, who came here, I think, as well, uh, or whatever, but they, we got in the mail these, they're mud flaps from some little Indian village. Uh, and uh, uh, Marion looks better than this. And uh, th this is, uh, this, I don't have a, 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 a slide of, of, um, of uh, the New York, uh, office, other than to say it was a very neat place. It was on uh, uh, Union Square. We were at number 33. We were on the seventh floor, and where there were two other people in the building that were interesting, and some others too. The music man down the corridor was an interesting guy. Marion Burkhalter, who I uh, will introduce to you, and you'll have you'll hear Marion and Christian lecture at some point, uh, but I'm sure you know their work. Uh, worked with us there for only th two or three months there, right? Oh, maybe more, maybe six months. And um, so at the top floor, we had this famous artist, uh, Saul Steinberg, uh, who was more known for his New York coverage than uh, his, his paintings, but he was, uh, he was good. And, uh, and then on the sixth floor, we had another Uh, so uh, this was uh, sort of cool. It was a, it was a period in uh, the world where the elevator door would open and you could see all of Andy Warhol's studio. Uh, it was just open. Everybody, it was open at that time uh, until, he, uh, until he got kind of shot. So I don't have pictures of that studio. This is 4 Rose Avenue, and you can see it uh, became too small uh, for us, and 90% uh, and of the time was spent finding things. Uh, and th this uh, looks out. It looks. This looks something like uh, out of uh, uh, the Bijoy Jane exhibition. Uh, I'm not sure he ever saw these, but he prob maybe he did. Uh, but these are just colored pigment. That uh, and, and this you'll see where this goes at some point. Uh, more of the. Uh, uh, And then we moved to the Howard Hughes space. It was fantastic. The, the best studio you could ever, it was the best studio in Los Angeles. It was, uh, it was uh, near the airport. No, nobody around at night, you'd have foxes come out. We're right, uh, right in the middle of Los Angeles, but it's, uh, it was, uh, and then we just had this huge space uh, with not too many people working here, but, um, but we filled it up. And then this is our space, uh, a, a terrible photograph of it, uh, downtown. Uh, 
with some people that uh, were working with us when we were doing the high school. Um, and then this, uh, we're going to get back to Grand Center in St. Louis. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to tell this story. W we got this, um, okay. We, we got this uh, commission to do a master plan for the middle of St. Louis to turn it into a performing arts center. It's just all the buildings existed and uh, the people, the Pulitzers and the various other people that were involved, they said, we want it to look like Lincoln Center. Uh, we, we want it to be like Lincoln Center. And uh, they had invited me to come for some weird reason. And they also invited James Terrell, the artist, to come. So we, we didn't know we were, we knew each other w well, but we, uh, uh, we, and, uh, but we just showed up and, it, James, what are you doing here? He said, well, they asked me to come here. I said, oh, gee, that's, that's great. And um, we asked them, how much, um, how much, uh, uh, what's your budget? What's the budget for the project? It's a great, it sounds like a great project. Uh, you know, taking existing buildings, maybe adding some and turning it into a real place. And they said, well, that's one problem. We really don't have too much money. Uh, and we, James and I looked at each other and we said, light. Doing lighting is probably all we're going to do. Uh, and that, but we were still excited by that because that's, that's mainly James's work, natural light mostly, but uh, he accepts the other as well. And <coughs> so I knew we weren't going to be living in St. Louis, and it was a complicated affair. And I had taught at Washington University for one semester. So I called up the dean and I said, could you, um, uh, can we have a seminar around this project? so that uh, we can get the, the students really to go out and understand the place and, and uh, document it well. Uh, and, and really, uh, and I said, they'll get a lot out of this and uh, it'll really help us a lot. So they, they said yes. And so we had a group of probably eight to 10 people. B. Joy Jane was one of these uh, students. And he, he uh, the one of the first things I did is like said, what. structure. Uh, there were a lot of photographs taken and so on, but uh, I, I said, each of you go off and make a kind of model that, that really s says what it's about. And uh, this is a, is, a, is a modification, but B. Joy Jane had a lot to do with this, and we, we uh, it probably was a kind of a collaboration, but we, so this is hard to see, but it's a, it's the model of uh, Grand Boulevard in St. Louis, and it uh, it's the first, w uh, without going too long about this, it's the, most architects do a rectangle. Sometimes they'll do a square. They never do a circle for a model base. For me, it's like, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, the, the, because it doesn't tell you, it, just to cut the world off arbitrarily in the rectangle, it doesn't make any sense. This just to... And so we, we talked about this some. So we said, take the, the things that are important and emphasize them in the model, producing what we then called uh, the analytical model. It's, it, it's, and so anybody can look at the model and understand the, the basic structure of the thing. It can go in all sorts of directions. It's, and it's your interpretation, but that's why they hire you, to make your interpretation. And in doing the model, it, uh, to, to, it also had this sort of hold up. So the back of the model was a further abstraction of what was there. The little square box blocks uh, to the west and the long blocks to the east and then Grand running through the center. And B. Joy uh, got hooked, I think, on that and uh, stayed with us on the project. And, and then, then he, he uh, that, that wasn't the end of it. He, he graduates. I don't know how I maybe brought it up with him before uh, he graduated because th this wasn't the last uh, class I think he, he was doing. So he was probably there another year. And I said, look, I, c I can probably get you a job in Richard, Miles, Richard Meyer's model shop because we set for, for doing the Getty Museum because uh, Richard had come to us and uh, seen a particular model and uh, he thought this is, he never had a model shop in his studio, so they only did, uh, sent out for presentation models. 
Um, and so uh, I got, we got Bijoy hired by uh, Richard, and he's, he lasted there for, I think, two years. Uh, along the way, I happened to have a, this maybe will help you sort of with the exhibition a little bit, who knows. But I, I, had, a, I had two Cadillacs, 1964 Cadillacs, and um, one of them, I, one I drove all the time, and the other was too good to pass up, so I got that one. And then, but the, right, the door on the, on the driver's side stopped working. So the only way to get into the car was to go through the passenger side to get to the steering wheel, and that's no fun. So I, I gave up on the car. And I, but I turned to Bijo, I said, look, you can have the car. Uh, uh, just get it insured and, uh, and uh, you know, fix the door if you want. And so he, he did that. And then Bijo uh, disappeared. And then he, he worked for a while, two years, I think, and then he, he, he uh, I'm sure he said goodbye, and then I didn't hear from him again until uh, a group of SIR students organized a, um, a, a studio in Mumbai. Um, and uh, I said, who else is, and they wanted me to come and be one of the instructors and some other people from SIR to come for like two weeks each. And uh, I said, who's the person like teaching it? The, the studio mainly from uh, Mumbai, and they said, this guy, Bijoy Jain. And by that time, I had sort of forgotten his name, but I said, Bijoy Jain, this rings a bell. And, uh, and then uh, it turns out it was Bijoy, and we went over there, and, uh, um, and, and Bijoy introduced me to the beginnings, I have to say, of what you see out there. Uh, he had just started off in the work. He'd done a, a, a superb building in Mumbai, a, a, a kind of restaurant bar renovation. And then this just followed suit, uh, all the stuff you see in there. Uh, I don't, he gives me credit, but, uh, but uh, he's, that's, that's through his ignorance. Uh, he, he, the credit comes from him for all this. Um, so this, this is the New York work. These I'm just going to race through, uh, I hope. Creative Playthings is a little toy store. Uh, Craig Hodgetts, myself, Lester Walker, and Keith Goddard collaborated on this. Um, it was, um, and I only have one slide, uh, but it was inspired by, uh, there was a famous artist hangout near where our studio was, and the art scene had come alive in New York. Uh, Soho was being created, and uh, this, is Dan, this is our version of Dan Flavin. Uh, but inside, yeah, you can see, well, you can't see it, but the, the, the neon is attached to the glass, but behind it are these aluminum blocks that uh, were inspired at uh, Max's Kansas City, uh, where all, everybody would hang out having lunch, and um, uh, by Donald Judd, and um, so we we decided that thin shelves in a toy store were no good because the toys are just a mess. They're all different sizes of boxes and so on and so forth. It's just you can't keep track. So if you can separate them with a kind of a neutral zone, then you could focus on looking at the toys for sale. And, um, and then we, we got onto Donald Judd and said, uh, you know, where does he have his things made? It turned out to be a, uh, a guy that made air conditioning duct work uh, at Ed Bernstein in Long Island City. Uh, this is the uh, Children's Learning Center. It was half a renovation and half uh, new construction. Um, and this probably looks incredibly dated, but uh, there it is. Um, and it was, this was, this was before, <laughs> I'm going to make believe I take credit for this, it wasn't. Well, what was in the air was the Centre Pompidou, but it hadn't quite been built yet. And, uh, but everybody was, like, thinking this. And uh, you never, if you ever do this, this is what not to do. So there's many lessons about what not to do here. Because you have to account for every single duct, a, a plumbing pipe, steam pipe, and conduit. You have to make drawings of all of it, because it's all going to be sort of out there and part of the of the look of the interior. Uh, and I think we, we uh, justified it by saying that the kids, but what a joke, uh, they're, they're only like uh, three to five years old, six years old. Th they would learn something about buildings this way, but it, but it uh, was okay. 
Then another project at that time, uh, a, a museum in New York, the Museum of Contemporary Crafts, was doing a, a great show on uh, called The Portable World. And they asked us if we w could contribute to it. And so we invented this thing called the portable person, uh, which ended up in Domus. But it was, it, the premise was a simple one. Everything that architecture gives you, this was the premise. Forget architecture, because it, it makes you go to it. Put it on your body. This is back in 19, where it is, the date 75, 76, 74. Uh, you take it, uh, take everything architecture can give you and put it on the body. Um, needless to say, a fair amount of this is, uh, you know, with the iPhones and, the, and so on and so forth has is, is, is come into being. But it wasn't that hard to think of, uh, but it, uh, uh, and it's still being played out. Um, some of it we got wrong. The, the handheld device, we didn't do. We, we put it on the wrist. The batteries we put on the, the waist, uh, and uh, but the clothes were heating and cooling and so on and so forth. So uh, you didn't need any of that, or the building. And then in 2000, we re revisited the project because things had changed enough that you could kind of revise it. The, the, probably the inspiration for us was Vin Vendor's film, film the, Till the End of the World, where he actually took things like the smart car, put them in the film before they even made the smart car, although he was talking to uh, apparently BMW at the time. And, um, but then the other thing was the search engine. It was this handheld device. This is before that was all in place. And there was a search engine of this bear. If you haven't seen the film, you have to see it. This bear would, you'd, you'd search for something and the bear would like turn around like, the, like they do in the, uh, the Apple uh, computer at least. Um, but we were also inspired by, this is, I think both of these are from Bernard Rudolfsky's book, uh, The Unfashionable Human Body, which is also a, a, a great book. It's sort of, you were talking about Semper today and uh, showing me the, the thing. It's uh, two directions, the, the primitive hut by Loger or the primitive hut by Semper, but he never really talked about it in that way. Uh, one is about the, the structure and the other is about the, the, the cladding. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, at some level, <laughs> the, the modernists uh, embr certainly embraced uh, uh, Loger's idea, uh, uh, but uh, what's on the table today is mostly Semper's idea about the cladding and, and certainly intelligent skins, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Rudowski sort of put all this on the table, again, uh, just for the human body. So these are, the one on the left I think is, uh, I'm not sure it's Rudowski, no. Uh, and this, is, this was just one of these things, which uh, is a precursor to the, the robo roach. Uh, was that in your show, the robo, the, the robot thing? No. The, um, but the, uh, uh, this is something called smart dust, which 10 years from now I guess we'll all have it. And it goes out and finds bad things in the air and protects you from it and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it will be in your body as well, the, the little nano things that are running around your body. Uh, I wish I had had it two weeks ago. Uh, I would have found these blood clots in me. Um, so this was the second version of the, of the thing updated. And, th and this is something, you know, so you do a, you do a project, and I have to say, uh, one of the things... Like, I was up to, hadn't seen Marianne's in Christian studio for a long time, and it was up there. And um, they do, you know, amazingly good work, great work. But I have to say, Christian is more excited about his 1959 Citroen <laughs> than, than the work. Is this true? <laughs> yes. And, and then Marianne... Has they do these books about things, but uh, one of them being about the Citroen, uh, designed by whoever it was, uh, and uh, but also books about the buildings they do, 
or parts of the buildings they do, but also books about other people's architecture. And uh, moving outside, just doing the projects is probably what to do uh, from time to time. It keeps you, and, and you really have to work at it. And so if you're, most of you are students here, but this means also doing stuff outside the classroom with, with your own work before you wait until you graduate. Uh, yeah, begin. It, it can turn out to be crappy. It doesn't matter. It becomes a, a way of living. Uh, this is uh, something Marianne Ray found in uh, Turkey. It's called the shepherd's coat, made of felt. The, the, the slide on the right shows more or less how it's made. A layer of felt's put down, paper put down, another layer of felt. Now it's a big tube because they mash it down. Then they slice it down the middle and then you can step into it. I, I should show the, I don't have the, the photograph of the being in it. So it's very thick, insulates and so on, and you wear it where, when it's cold. And tur this is from Turkey. But the amazing thing is, uh, Semper would, would, would die if he could have seen this, is that most of the time watching the sheep is not much to do. So the, you sit down, and when you sit down with this coat, the coat stays above you like a house. It, it doesn't come down with you because it's so stiff. So it's a kind of a coat that becomes a house or co becomes a building. And then this, uh, this is where I get a telephone call from uh, a young woman uh, at Princeton uh, who you just said you were doing something down there, but I didn't quite believe it. Uh, but I still don't know why she was there. And she said she wanted to... Uh, come up and interview for uh, any work. And usually we didn't have too much work. And, um, but we had something, which is this immovable objects exit. Uh, that's when we first met. And uh, she put out her portfolio, which included all of the drawings, the, the, the really, oh boy, how can I describe this? These were drawings that, Archogram, you know more than Super Studio, but uh, hopefully you, you know both. Archogram's things were uh, exuberant, uh, uh, almost cartoonish at times, but uh, you know a building that could walk around the city and so on. Sometimes they were over the the, the wall. Uh, the the Super Studio projects, theoretical projects, were much more cutting, and uh, and and they uh, more more haunting and. Uh, Marianne had worked on all, all the drawings, I think. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's not clear what the, the, the men actually did in that firm, but uh, <laughs> like that, Natalini and so on, but whatever. Um, and so she showed me this thing, and I said, Marianne, uh, I should be asking you for a job. You shouldn't be asking me for a job. But, but she then joined us, uh, not on just this one occasion, but on two others. She would fly from Switzerland over and then spend six months or or uh, two months to, to work for us. Um, uh, and this this was, uh, this will go fast. This was putting part of the city on an exhibition for the uh, National Museum of Design in New York, but they didn't have any building yet. So you had to put the exhibition on in Lower Manhattan, and uh, you're not going to see too much of it. Uh, it was a kind of a route. Uh, the catalog was a, was, a, was a newspaper you could buy at the newsstand. And for the opening, this is the most amusing part, uh, there was this parade of buildings that, that the architects that had done buildings in lower Manhattan, this happens, this is SOM. This is the best work of SOM, uh, in my opinion. But uh, I mean, I wouldn't have, th near the, uh, what used to be the World Trade Center. And, um, so they, you had the, it was a, a gridded out building, so you had to walk, and they realized you couldn't walk in the building on a parade like this. And so they cut strips, like pleats, on a, in a, on a dress, so then when you walked, you could walk like this, and the thing just would bend up. I called up Peter Eisenman, and I asked him, I said, Peter, I knew him a little bit, and uh, he, he kind of knew, uh, uh, but he was, he was, he, Peter and the gang there at the Institute 
changed the face of architecture in the 20th century, the latter part of the 20th century, I have to say. Uh, 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 and maybe, maybe uh, it was uh, misguided, uh, but I don't think so, but it put architecture on the map in terms of not just within architecture, but within the, uh, the larger picture. And uh, I said, Peter, I know you haven't done a building in Lower Manhattan, but perhaps you would like to do one. But you, you just make a model and it'll be part of their parade. And he said, no, I'm not interested. So Peter, he doesn't like China either, uh, the, uh, like most Americans. Um, so, <laughs> he, so he said, but I have a guy here who's writing a book about uh, New York City. Uh, why don't you come up and talk with him? So I said, okay. Uh, so I went up and, and talked to uh, this guy, and he, you know, we talked for a while, but he wasn't that interested either. Uh, that happened to be, the book happened to be, uh, uh, what is it, Delirious New York, and uh, the author uh, escapes me, uh, Rem something, Cool House, I think. Uh, then, then, um, Marianne didn't know she was going to get on the spot here, but, uh, <laughs> The, uh, we got this great commission, uh, they don't come along too often, where the patron, the client, is not just interested in a, getting a building done, but interested in the ideas within the building. And, and uh, these people, they were, they're in the middle of America, uh, the director had studied with the child care center director in Brooklyn. The whole crowd were basically Marxists, uh, socialists, and uh, uh, not radical. Their thinking uh, uh, was, and so we uh, we did this project. Began began in in Manhattan in, at uh, 33 Union Square West, then. Craig was in California, and I said, Craig, uh, how are we going to do this building? He said, or I said, are you interested in working together? He said, sure. He said, uh, he said can you come out to Los Angeles? I said, no, not really. And, and he said, I said, do you want to move to New York for the summer? He said, oh, not really, because uh, it's too expensive. And so he, he calls back later. He says, Charles Moore has a... Connecticut, and uh, I, he can rent some space out to us. So we ended up uh, with Marion Berhalter, uh, spending how much was it? Two months probably doing the the project, um, and then uh, then they didn't raise enough money, or didn't they were raising money for a year or two years. I was in Rome with the American Academy, and Craig was in Venice, and. Uh, and uh, we designed the building. They, they didn't have enough money to do the building, which you'll see in a second, that we, we liked a lot. And so we had to come up with another, a, a less expensive building than this thing and uh, did that over the telephone. This is the, what was built. And, but this was the first project for it, um, which is a series of six parallel walls, which you can see here. Uh, that, that and they, uh, f for us, it was like saying, have you ever seen the photograph of the uh, bottom of the Colosseum in Rome? They have these parallel walls. And we said, God, it's like renovating that, those walls. And there, there's, a, uh, I think, a Van Eyck drawing also that is sort of like these lines. Um, and that's somebody's drawing. Uh, I won't mention who. Um, and then, then we, you can see there's a little bit of the remnant of the thing built in, in the project that we actually uh, carried out, um, which was all done in, in Venice, in California. Uh, some drawings you can't probably see. Um, I'll stop here for a second. Um, the and uh, what to do and what not to do. So uh, you, it's your call. But in from about 1965, 70 to about 1995, 
what was on the table within architecture education, but also within people's practices, was uh, that there was a close relationship between the artifacts that you use to design the buildings and the, the theoretical sort of part of the, the work. And so you just didn't do this kind of drawing because you liked doing it. Y you, you put those two together. Uh, starting around 1995, more so around 2000, that disappeared. Perez Gomez wrote this, the, the famous book on the, on the subject and the passionately believed in it. And then uh, a bunch of software came on the, uh, out and it just changed the whole discussion and, and the, to no discussion. Uh, 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 what to do, I, I would say, is, is, to, is to interrogate those new powerful tools and capture them rather than letting them capture you. That's, that's, my, that's a little sermonizing, but there it is. There was this great educator in America, Serge Shemaev. He was teaching at Columbus, Ohio, uh, the University of uh, Ohio State University, and he went down to see the building. And he was a big hero on the East Coast and uh, of ours, one of the great teachers. And he said, "This for him, this was the best building he'd ever seen, made with table scraps, because uh, nothing was fancy in the building at all, zero. Uh, it, we 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 liked that compliment a lot." This uh, was, uh, it says it's being, been designed in, in Venice, California, which it was, uh, uh, and also in uh, Mantova, Italy, but that's uh, not quite true about Mantova, but you'll, you'll see why. Um, it was a little uh, uh, residence in Venice, California, and gallery for uh, Larry's graduated around the world. and. And uh, one of the, he's, he is the kingpin of, of the gallery owners. We don't talk to each other anymore. But the, the um, if you haven't seen the building on the left, you have to go see it. Designed by a painter, Montagna. Uh, and it's, uh, it, you stand in the courtyard, and you look up, and the square, which is actually bigger than the circle, but because of perspective, it's, it's exactly in size. So, so it's the square and the circle the Renaissance uh, person from Vitruvius built. And so we didn't do as, as uh, anything as uh, momentous as that, but uh, the building has a kind of a hole in it. We get the light down into the residential spaces. Then, um, this is a, s a series of projects, but it, 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 uh, it has to do with, um, it was a kind of a, I don't know, this is what not to do when we were doing it. And it was making models out of plaster. And uh, um, it, we were doing this, I had a group of UCLA students over in Rome. We were, we were they let us use some space for, for two months. And uh, and then uh, I don't know how how long were you down there for two weeks or something. Uh, Marianne came down again for, for uh, to help out, and um, I the students were off uh, shopping most of the time in Rome, and uh, I didn't know how to keep them in the studio working on this competition. And I'm not too good at, at organizing people, and I. And I knew drawings was too difficult. You, you, I couldn't manage the drawings uh, with them working on it and, and uh, disparate ideas and just keeping the thing together. And I thought, if we could get going on a model, then everybody can participate on that and we can really keep it, uh, keep it straight. And I, one of the students, we went down into Rome. Uh, it was a, let's say, Thursday night or something. and. Um, we had dinner, and I was moaning about how are we going to keep everybody together, and uh, you know, to get this thing done, this competition. It was for a, it was for a park in Pistoia, 
uh, Pistoia, we thought was a hill town. But then we get up there, and it turns out it's flat. It's in the valley where Florence is. And, uh, it, uh, but it, it's famous for being the nursery for trees in all of Europe because they have tremendous groundwater. And it was a demonstration park for these, uh, these nurseries. So uh, somebody, a buyer in France or somebody could come down, see all the types of trees in a, in a neat place and, uh, and, and make their deal. Um, so we were finished the meal. We went out and we were walking back up to the Janicolo, the, where the American Academy was. And I said, um, I walk, walk by this shop and it's all inside. It's, there's plaster pieces, but they're not models, obviously. They're, they were like cornices. And uh, in the United States, we would, it would be a, um, maybe in France too, it would be a wallpaper shop, which I don't even think they have anymore, but it would be some kind of a weird deal. In Italy, it's like people trick out their rooms with plaster parts uh, that they can buy in the shop. And uh, so, so I said, God, this is neat. And so I, we bought some, I bought some plaster things and I went up to the academy. And just by chance, this uh, architect, uh, Giuseppe Rebecchini, came um, up. We had known each other a little bit and he was, uh, he eventually became the, uh, ar the architecture for Rome the architect for Rome and some kind of official uh, thing, but a, but a good designer. And uh, and uh, he, I showed him the plaster and I said, what's the story on this? He said, oh, well, actually, I said, can you make models out of plaster? And he said, yeah, he said, actually, uh, I'll introduce you. Helped, worked on the model of Rome, that big model that's the size of this room, um, and also built the model of Hadrian's Villa. So we went down to see his studio, and he was about 75 years old, and he, just, he showed us how to do the whole thing. Marble table, kind of a paraffin and oil that you rub into the table. You can pour the plaster on it, uh, run screeds across it, make thin sheets, make thick sheets, carve it to make it look like th there's a sidewalk and a road and so on and so forth. And uh, so we got, th this model was the first, first of a bunch that, um, this one has disappeared. It, uh, it's probably in the city hall in Pistoia. We didn't win the competition. We, we liked the, uh, the scheme. It was an a kind of an aqueduct that fed the, the different demonstration sort of parks for the trees, um, irrigating it. And the second uh, competition, it was uh, I think the next year or two years later, was for a. Uh, they bombed the train station in Bologna, so they were going to sort of repair it and make a new station. They never did this project, I think, uh, did a project for it. Um, and we, and we uh, uh, another trip by Marion Burkhalter to come down and say, Robert, uh, <laughs> but it was, we went to this printer because we knew to make the drawings for the thing, uh, I don't know, we wanted to make posters because we like posters on the walls in, in uh, the cities of Italy. And uh, we went to the printer and we said, gave him the text and said, use different kinds of type in the, in the text. Don't just use one typeface, because uh, it's sort of like some of these train station posters. And so he said, I can't do that. And we said, why not? It's like you just put different type. Uh, and so he said, that's against my nature that battle. Um, but then we went further and he, he said, uh, you know, uh, Bologna, halfway between uh, Rome and Milano, uh, Caligano. What does that mean, Marian? Uh, a city constructed uh, in many years and a city constructed in few years, uh, looking east and looking west. And the printer it's just, it's a printer. Uh, he said, I can't, I, I won't write that. Thing. So, so I, I, I said, well, I don't know. In America, it's like we're always looking west and east. It's like the thing. You know, the sun setting in the west. It's, uh, the sun rises in the east. It's, it's got to mean something. He said, Italy, we don't do that. We look north and south, but not east and west. <laughs> so, uh, not battle. He wasn't happy about it. <laughs> and then, th 
this was the first plaster model where we uh, learned that we could, you could use, uh, again, these are lessons of what not to do. Uh, but I have to say, if you start doing something uh, with a, uh, as an obsession, it, it really keeps you, it, it keeps you focused. It's, it's, it's very useful. Anyway, we, we learned how to mix these colored pigments in plaster cast sheets and, and make the model. This, this, was, this model we still have. And there's another version of it. This was for a little apartment in New York. These are about that big. And the, yet another competition. This was with James Terrell for a winery in Napa Valley. Robert Mondavi was on the jury. He was uh, the winemaker, and uh, but my former partner, uh, Craig Hodges, was on the jury. I saw, so we thought we haven't made Craig can sweet talk anybody, and um, so um, except Robert Mondavi, as it turns out. But they were trying to make Napa Valley become a. You probably you know the name, so it's, it's a famous wine place in California, and. Uh, and and he he finally convinced the jury. He says, "Look, you may like this scheme, but uh, but this other architect is is world famous. Who uh, that was Michael Graves. So Michael won the. Um, that's hard to see. Um, and then the the last plaster model was done." Uh, for James Durrell, this is where Marianne Ray and I really met over this model, and um, the um, it's a, it's a uh, James took a series of two and a quarter uh, photographs in an airplane uh, flying over the site. Uh, this is the Roden Crater thing in Arizona, and um, and then we made these panels um, in a complicated process that replicated the the coloration of the Earth. Uh, this is nine feet by 27 feet. And this had to do with the alignments of the thing. Then, then um, there's some furniture. Um, not quite serious as, I don't know how to put this. It's furniture because it's, uh, it's uh, I think re doing real furniture, I think, is, especially furniture that can be produced is, is really difficult, but we, we tried to. This was a, uh, a table called Venice for uh, the uh, Sanchez and Mendini had organized this thing called uh, uh, Memphis in the, in the 1980s. And... Um, I, I knew him a little bit in Los Angeles, and he said, why don't you do something? And so we, we kind of invented this titanium table, thinking that it would be the lightest table ever designed, because it is light. It's stronger than steel and, and, uh, and, and obviously much lighter. Um, it turned out that uh, the joint in the corners was not properly uh, detailed or engineered, and so the table would wiggle. It was, it was a great table for putting jello on or something that would uh, make use of the wiggle. But um, it, it and, and this got kind of resurrected about two years ago uh, to, to actually produce a run of it. But uh, then the it's anodized, but anodizing titanium is different than anodizing aluminum. With aluminum, it's really a, a it's like a coating on the thing. Titanium, you you could anodize titanium by just taking a flame and putting it over the titanium. It is it, you really burn it. it. They they dip it in a, a solution, but it it's uh, it's electrical current which sort of burns the titanium, and you can control the color. This is a it was a peculiar project. This we had seen in Arezzo. It's a uh, the uh, a Giotto deal, I think. Well, maybe not. Um, it's a crucifix. You won't see the other side. But um, in a Giotto painting, Giotto 
paints the crucifix. It's where St. Francis uh, got drunk and saw God and uh, and became a... Uh, And so that's the the crucifix um, that he... uh, Not of St. Francis, but of Christ. Um, But we started looking at at the the Giotto frescoes and um, we liked... We like this sort of simple furniture that existed. Um, so the crucifix, yes, but then uh, we looked in there, and there's a there's a kind of a simple little thing to hold clothes uh, or or blankets in the cab, a kind of freestanding cabinet. And so we did that. Oops, oh, there's something missing there. And then. Uh, And the, these are all just made of this kind of simple wood, and coated with a co- coated with it's really a plaster, uh, like thing pigment and it's a, it's sort of plaster. And then um, this is the segue out of plaster models. It was a house in. Uh, Los Angeles for a, a kind of a neat guy till he canceled the project, um, and and this was uh, this wooden model. This was the uh, the model that uh, Richard Meyer spotted in our studio and said, "I want to build. I want you to set up a model shop for us so we can build models of the Getty," which they did for ten years. Uh, with a budget of about a million dollars a year. Um, and this is, it was just a cherry wood model, but it was, um, uh, it was the main tool to design the house. I mean, the drawings, yes, of course, but they um, just sort of working uh, uh, meticulously in trying this, trying that, trying this, trying that. Uh, our, st- our students in Syrac, when they're making models these days, and this is what not to do, but they do it. Um, they just have the, uh, take the Rhino model, you know, flatten it all out, and have all the things laser cut, and then they get it, put it together, and that's the model. And so it misses the point of, uh, like, designing as a, as a models. Not, if, it, if the model's just a presentation model, that's cool. But if it's a, a model you're making sort of to help you design the thing, and that's, it seems like the last way you want to do it. And then this um, is uh, this uh, complicated project, which I, I think I, I'm, I'm going to try to fly through. Uh, it was a master plan for the city of St. Louis. I t- we talked about this before. Bijoy is connected to this thing. Uh, and... Uh, there you can see, you can remember the plaster, uh, the, well, it looked like a plaster model, but it was a, uh, it was a wood model painted white. Uh, but Grand Boulevard is running across the thing, the little kinks at the ends. Um, and this is the master plan. This, the planners in St. Louis, when they saw this, they said, this is terrible. Where's the piazza? Where's the focus, et cetera, et cetera. What we did, and I, I, I'm not going to be able to show this very well, uh, but you'll get a sense of it. We developed f- seven master plans, seven ideas for master plans that evolved, that that grew out of our observations of the place. So, uh, Grand Boulevard had two intersections that bracketed it. There, there were nothing special, especially the one on the right, the one on the left more so. And then there was a concert, the symphony played in the building down here, and up here it was a Fox Theater, 4,500-seat sort of 1920s extravaganza that you would find in America. And then there was a, a little, in the, in the parking lot up there, a little recital hall. And they wanted more, uh, again, to turn the thing in the Lincoln Center. And uh, so... Let's see if we... Oh, then we built, yeah, another large model covered with vinyl tile. 
and uh, the building's painted with Zolotone, a kind of a speckly paint. And, uh, and then we, we sort of built a stage to get up on to sort of view the model. The model's about, I think, eight feet by 24 feet long. We, we, we realized this was, they were going to be raising money forever for this project, and we realized they needed something, not a little model like this to get excited by, but go into a room and everybody sort of jump up on the stage and be part of the, the project. And uh, it, it, it worked, I think. Um, the first layer it was, uh, oh, and we, and we did seven master plans and we showed the two of them and they were all, we liked them all. And um, we, we showed it to them, but we said, give us some guidance. Where do you want us to go with this? And they said, well, And then Richard Gaddis, who was the director of the thing, uh, uh, he said, you know, we said, well, that doesn't help us uh, that you like them all. T tell us which one you like most. And he said, no, I don't know. We like them all. Why can't we have them all? And we, we, th we uh, Mary and I s lo looked at each other, uh, said, yeah, why not? And it was a new way to conceive of a, a master plan where you, instead of it becoming some kind of a shaped thing with uh, that that had, you know, instructions about and observations about what's there and where it should go and so on, that you could look at it and it looked like a plan. Uh, it, uh, if you took all the master plans and put them on top of each other, it no longer had from the air looking down on it, it no longer had the, uh, the simplicity of a, quote, master plan. It didn't look like an emblem. And, uh, and therefore, the planners in, in St. Louis, educated Harvard, they, they said this is no good. Um, but we looked at it, and then we realized, hey, it looks like a city. <laughs> Cities are messy. And as long as within that messiness, there's intelligence there, of, of that that has learned from the observations and has learned thinking about where the thing wants to go, that we'd probably be okay. It, looking at it from the air, it's not going to look like much, but when you're down there experiencing the thing, m much it, it's much better. Uh, this one is called Grand On Stage Off Stage, and it was simply that the buildings along Grand Boulevard all had facades facing the street. This is a typical American thing. You do less of this in Europe. Um, and the sides of the buildings were blank. And the back was blank, but it had fire escapes. So this was like being backstage in the theater, the place where everybody, and then behind that, this was all empty land that was parking for these venues. And uh, so we just said, well, that's maybe a good way to go and do more of it. So grand onstage, offstage. And we showed uh, and talked with uh, Terrell about the fire escapes and in terms of lighting and so on and so forth. And he, and we said, he said, blue light. He said, I love blue light. You land in, land at an airport, and there's those great blue lights that on the on the runway. Uh, why don't we light the uh, fire escapes with this kind of eerie blue light? Um, so that the grand on stage, off stage, uh, said. It's a prop that eventually will go on stage. It's, it's a prop for your stage, which is Grand Boulevard. Um, and this is, this was another um, uh, one of the layers called the street in the green, Grand Boulevard, the, the street. And Richard Gaddis wanted, uh, he was English, and he said, can't we have a village green? And we said, like it's St. Louis, a uh, village green. It's like you could have it in England, but not St. Louis, but we finally, said, okay, we'll try to do one. Uh, and the building on the bottom existed, but they wanted to build a new theater on this other street, and so we sort of put it there. And, um, but the green, which was uh, underneath was parking, uh, sort of s sloped down in, and this was a tilted up green to get you to the, uh, the theater, which is raised up a level. But the, the, the green went to the edge of the uh, rectangle, and then, instead of seeing a big concrete
at all. So it was a kind of a magic green. Um, another one was discrete elements. Um, uh, th along Grand Boulevard, the buildings that existed, they're all different. They're, all, they're weird buildings. This is the typical of American cities. Nobody quite agrees on much of anything. And somebody does this one, and somebody does that one. And so they're all sort of varied. And, and we, s we said, let's go with the flow, because we can't change it. You can't uh, unify anything. So any time a new building is added, it's just a different thing. Uh, the only one that's been added, has so been going on for years here, is that Tadeo, Tadeo Ando building up in the upper uh, left-hand side. And one of the weirdest buildings was this 25-story this, uh, tower. The, it was an Art Deco office building, and it was uh, completely empty. Uh, I don't know, it had asbestos problems or something. And it was for sale. This was back in about 1980, 1990-something. It was for sale for $25,000. And we looked at each other and said, let's just buy the building. Uh, and we didn't do it, unfortunately. Uh, now it's all lofts. But, but we, the discrete elements d emphasized the building. And so, and again, the lighting proposals. So out the top of the building became a, a big beam of light going way up into the sky. So if you're anywhere you're in St. Louis, the presence of Grand Center would, would come out from that. And we, we had a, 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 I ran a Kyle, a uh, fabulous uh, designer, uh, uh, a student of mine at UCLA, and she, um, she's teaching down at Tulane now. And Mary and I uh, ran out of the studio to go up and teach, and uh, we, we yelled to her and said, they want to have the circuits practice here at Grand Center. And so she didn't really quite understand what we were saying. And so we left and we came back. She had put this, uh, like a Roman circus, uh, she said, uh, in, the, in the parking lot. But we looked at it and said, well, that, that could be cool. If you build that out of wood uh, and, and the circus can practice there and, and maybe they set it up and dismantle it every year or something, that could be all right. So instead of one Times Square and then nothing else around it, it would be like little Times Squares. But, you know, I would hardly call it Times Square. And we've been dying to do this project sometime, uh, to raise the obelisk in Rome. Um, they, um, uh, somebody help me with the name of the, of the uh, architect, but they, they, they spent 200 years trying to figure out how to raise the obelisk, and then they, they finally raised it, and uh, it was an architect that designed the, the device. But when they got part, the Pope said, don't let anybody in the crowd say a word or they'll, they'll be executed on the spot. Um, and so the thing's going up, and it's about halfway up, and the, sp the, the ropes are, are s steam is coming off the ropes. Uh, they're about to catch fire. And the people doing this work were, were um, pe people that were sailors. And they knew exactly what their problem was. The fi friction was going to, these, r these ropes were going to burst into flames, and he yelled out, you know, one guy yelled out, water on the ropes, and he threw water on the ropes and saved the day, and the thing got up. But they still put the guy in jail. Uh, the Pope t put him in jail, but he, uh, and uh, now there's a, a holiday in, in Italy for this guy that said water on the ropes. Um, and it, it's, it said something about architectures, the possibility of architecture uh, making, uh, be, being active in theatr and theatrical, uh, and not just a kind of lump that sits on the ground, no matter how elegant it might be. Overlaid patterns has to do with very subtle sort of affairs on the curbs, maybe manhole covers, uh, uh, places to sit around uh, at, at the scale, at an intimate scale, that perhaps uh, would be more, more 
influential in, in your in your perception of the place than any big moves that you could make. And then light up was a series, a series of lighting proposals that uh, we saw this. This is a fire escape, and it had these were the, sh the shadows, and we we saw this and we said, "Geez, this this looks like sheet music." And uh, we showed it to uh, the, the music people that were part of the gang, and they said, "Yeah, that's that's neat. We never we've never seen that before," and we said, "Okay." This is in the daytime, and nobody's going to notice it. Uh, in the daytime, they're not even there in the daytime. Um, but what if we do this at night, and we project from down below? So this is the side of this is the side of the symphony, but it's it's blank. You're going to park your car in a kind of a darker area, come up, and so this was an attempt to sort of bring light to the building, but in a, in a I don't know if you call it a natural way, but a, certainly a theatrical way. And Mary Miss, the artist, was was not working with us, but she was part of the of the client patron uh, uh, team. And she she said, "We put we thought if you put greenhouses at the end of the parking lots, way away from Grand Boulevard, that at night you could light turn the lights on in these greenhouses, and you'd feel safe at the end of the parking lot." Uh, they never, they never I instituted that thing, but it was we thought it was a good idea. And then Mary said, "Well, what about trees on wheels?" And we, <laughs> we said, "What are you talking about?" She said, "Well, the greenhouse you could keep the trees in the winter in the greenhouse, but during the season, she said, you're the ones who talked about grand on stage, off stage, off stage are props. So the trees are like props, and you bring them out in the spring, and then you make an arrangement." Uh, in the, in the in the the whole thing called Grand Center, and then another lighting proposal. This one we did, uh, I guess I don't know what you say installed. Uh, it was called Laser Lid. In the piazzas in Italy, they all uh, when they were established, they always had a kind of a pattern of lines in the ground to kind of make it into something. Not always, but but often, and. Uh, we just so we that was not going to happen uh, clearly, and so we we decided we thought well we could do this with a l laser lines in the sky and make these uh, there were four patterns that um, of these lights and it would sort of go from one to the other to the other, um, and um, they had to do with alignments of things they were, they were slightly silly things but uh, well some weren't uh, like northeast southwest and the summer solstice and the winter winter solstice and the equinox and so on. But uh, others were locating spots in the world that were, uh, that came out of operas, uh, like in Egypt. And then the parking lots, there, there were tons of them. They, something had to be done. And we, we thought growing trees so that each one would become a kind of a park would be a good idea. And uh, our, our favorite one was, uh, I don't know whether you can see it here. Um, was in Italy they they when they grow certain kinds of trees I think they're fruit trees peach trees maybe um, they train the branches to grow just in one direction I can you know it's facing south so the sunlight can get to it and so one tree doesn't cast a shadow on the next tree and uh, the uh, uh, it's called a pleach tree so we thought those would be sort of nifty in the parking lots, uh, one of the parking lots. Oh, yeah. And so this is what the master plan of all seven layers looks like, nothing. But uh, within it, uh, hopefully, w w was the intelligence of the whole thing. Here's another thing, um, uh, uh, what to do. This is definitely, well, this is probably what not to do because we've done it, but uh, <laughs> but you could do it somewhere else, and then maybe it's a what to do. Um, Hadrian's Villa, uh, and this is our studio down just north of Rome uh, in Roncilioni, when we were doing this work. We just Piranesi measured Hadrian's Villa, spent 27 years doing it, 
It's a little known fact of, uh, of his work. And he signs in one of the little cryptoporticos, he signs his name Piranesi and he writes about uh, 27 years of hard work. And uh, for some reason, and there was no really good drawing of Hadrian's Villa. Uh, and we decided to measure the thing. So we spent uh, 10 summers there with uh, students like yourselves uh, for two and a half months and, uh, and eventually measured the entire thing. Uh, our work stopped in 1995. It's picked uh, one of the, uh, he's a classicist uh, uh, from UCLA and he, uh, he's the person that has, has pioneered um, computer uh, simulations of uh, archaeological sites. So he's the one who did the uh, Colosseum. You've probably seen it on the television. Uh, so you can get into the Colosseum and move around the thing, and, and also Rome. So we're, in, uh, we're thinking, of not thinking, this is moving towards modeling the villa, uh, but also having a website where all the archaeology work would be accessible through the, this one master website. Um, this is one of the uh, buildings you would never see at Hadrian's Villa. Uh, it's an underground thing. It has the exact same plan as the Serapis uh, in um, Saqqara, where they buried the bulls. Uh, this is a tunnel with offset rooms. But this one is for storing snow. And a typical uh, set of measurements. Um, and then I'll fly through these, a few more projects, and then we're there. Uh, this is an Armenian school, uh, a library and gymnasium, really. Um, The gymnasium is, they had no land. It's in the middle of the city in, in, in Hollywood. And um, th th so the gym is like a big thing that's just, the scale is, is, is g was going to wreck whatever playground space they had. So we shoved that down in the ground. And then the library we raised up off the ground. And this was one of the uh, projects where the, the, the client, the patron, was really uh, with us on it. We showed it to, to them and they said, oh, this is, this is like Noah's Ark because that's part of the Armenian mythology. Uh, they claim that Noah's Ark landed on Mount Ararat. And, uh, and then one of the board chairmen, uh, yeah, the board chairman said, God, for the openings, we'll have a, like a screen set up with uh, raging waters on top of the gym. And uh, you could be in the library and sort of like experience the whole Noah's Ark thing. And they stayed with us uh, all the way through this thing. And this, I think, is the last project. Uh, this, this is, I don't know, we thought it was what to do, but, uh, and it probably still is what to do, but uh, there's a bit of what not to do in this as well. It was uh, the largest high school that the Los Angeles School District took on. They had a $17 billion bond issue in California for schools in Los Angeles. And uh, this was, uh, was, a, was a big one. And um, we got hired on a fluke uh, because we said we were collaborating with John Jurdy. And uh, he's a, the shopping center king of the US, at least, and uh, some other places in Asia. And uh, so we snagged the project. But Los Angeles School District is the worst school district in the United States. And uh, to top that off, the, they, they didn't allow any educator to be involved in the programming of the school. So uh, that, was, uh, that was odd. And then the people that managed the project were all from the Navy, the U.S. Navy, as project managers. And so uh, we, we were not, uh, there's certain things were, that were scrapped when they were doing the construction, and we're, we're unhappy about that. But for the most part, they, they, uh, the whole thing is, is there. Um, 
And we wanted to, Neutra had done a series of schools in Los Angeles. When he came to Los Angeles, he said, why are they building East Coast schools? Double loaded quarter, classrooms, two stories, three stories, in a climate like Los Angeles. And so he, early on, he instituted a, uh, or he, he designed a little primary school uh, that was uh, classrooms lined up with a single loaded quarter, but the quarter was outdoors, covered but not covered all the way. Uh, and then just lots of grass around it. So we, we thought the high school would benefit from having most of the classrooms uh, having a, a single loaded corridor so you could look down, you could, you could look at, the students could look at each other in an environment different than a, a double loaded corridor looking at the backs of heads as you're going from class to class. Um, and we still feel pretty strongly about that. essentially a kind of L-shaped affair with a whole series of courtyards. Uh, not a very expensive budget, to say the least. Uh, the auditorium, this is all Douglas fir plywood covering the uh, uh, inside. The kids outsmarted us, but uh, you know what can you do? Um, they not not this particular. Who knows whether this group or not? But they, uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough crowd, and uh, so fire escapes, uh, the the fire stairs. You put the buzzer on so that when they open the door to get out of the the building, the buzzer goes on, so you won't do that. That didn't they didn't they didn't pay any attention to that. And then they put cameras in the fire stairs so they could see who's doing it. And uh, the kids immediately found out where the cameras had blind spots so they could find places that beat up each other on these things. But uh, we wouldn't change it. And then the, the final project, though it's not really a project, but it's, it's part of our life, um, is called Base Beijing. And we have a large studio in, in uh, Beijing. It was originally about uh, 6,500 square meters in the, the Arts District 798, uh, which she merged in the, in the, like from 2001 to 2006 and, and still today. And it put Chinese art on the map um, and, and it evolved through this, this place called 798. The, the buildings were fabulous. I have no photographs of them here but they were designed by East German uh, engineers out of the Bauhaus. Um, and they're just uh, these, these uh, it's a sawtooth roof, but it, they, there are these arches, there are these uh, vaults. They're not flat like that, they just, they curve up like that. And then glass coming down like that. And uh, uh, with double pane glasses, glass, they, they, they you do in Switzerland in your sleep and, and in Germany, but it was new to us. And, and uh, the windows opened only in the inside. The outside ones didn't open. I couldn't figure it out until I f finally realized you have to wash the windows <laughs> on both sides, so you have to get one of them has to open. And, less, and they didn't need ventilation because it was a factory. Um, and we, so w we lost that space. And uh, the, a week after the, on national television, China uh, 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 announced uh, on the English-speaking television station, at least, that when people come to Beijing, they're going to see the Olympic buildings, the Forbidden City, the Great Wall, and 798, the Arts District. I mean, this is, this is a country that is it, known in the West as being, uh, you know, repressing artists and so on. Well, anything but. They, they realized that this was like a showcase of... Uh, you know, they were allowing artists to do anything. In 1999, they didn't. And so you couldn't name a building a gallery that was against policy. So uh, they, you couldn't do that. So, but by 2002, that had changed. In 2004, the government stepped in and said, you're not going to tear down 798. 
aspect because this is too important. Uh, the buildings are important, but also what's happening here is important. And um, so they, uh, they, and they also realize, at least we thought, and some of our friends there, it turns out art is not dangerous uh, in, 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 the, in the government's mind. Um, in, in the US, we had one instance of when somebody um, made a Christ figure out of, uh, I don't know, cow poop or something like that. Uh, and uh, they closed the whole exhibition down in Brooklyn. It was about uh, eight or 10 years ago. Um, so that was just, uh, I, don't, I don't know, it wasn't dangerous. It just was, it was sort of obscene in many people's eyes. So, but in China, they, they finally realized, hey, these artists, uh, nobody, it's not gonna influence anybody. It's not completely true uh, because it brought a kind of uh, uh, freedom and they, they had no problem tolerating it. It's, it's just as, as long as, and, and much of the art was political, but the, the leaders, the artists were clever. They, 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 it was political, everybody could see it, but the leaders couldn't, and they, they, they worked very hard to sort of do that. A lot of the art is not political, but, but some of it is. And one of the, one of the areas, that, uh, which I, I won't show you here, but one of the areas of the uh, uh, Chinese art, which as architects, is that the, uh, the making, the big, the heroes in China for us, we've been there since uh, the year 2000, uh, are the construction workers. They, they work 12 hour shifts, summer, autumn, winter, and spring, but they work two shifts. They, they work one shift and another crew comes on the second shift. So you, if you have the, the night shift in the winter, yeah, you're, you're, it's tough and uh, e even a little dangerous. Um, we, so we got booted out of 798 and then we, we moved into this little urban village called uh, Chao Chang Di across the street. We weren't the first to move there. The, the, the first person to move there and, he, and it's an instance where architecture changed the place. Urban villages are, where, are just these humble little places. Beijing has about, uh, uh, what would we say, maybe three or four million migrant workers. All cities have them. Zurich has them. They, uh, all cities have them. Um, and in Beijing, they live mainly, either they live in your apartment because they're taking care of your kids, or mostly live in these urban villages. Beijing has 500 of them, uh, but they're, all Chinese cities have them. All Indian cities have them. All cities in South America have them, and so on. It's one of the, and they are, if you want to call them that, they're three meter by five meter uh, spaces, and it's universal throughout the world. Um, uh, it turns out not to be such a bad space. No kitchen, no bathroom. The kitchen's down the hall, the bathrooms are down the hall. Um, so the person that changed uh, this place, uh, Chao Chang Di, which is now the, the famous art, arts, um, well, you call, I guess we call it an urban village, is Ai Weiwei, the artist and sometimes architect. Uh, he's across the street from where we are. And uh, that's just the studio. And it, we, we, the premise of, of Base Beijing is architectural education, but a kind of time out from the routine. Uh, time out meaning they really are throughout uh, the, the world this way. You have seminars and studio, and the, the, the studio meets three times a week, sometimes two times a week. It's like, it's a routine, it's, it's everywhere. And it gets the job done, so it's, it's not like it's a huge problem. But we thought one of the things, uh, we as instructors thought, uh, you know, you give yourself over to the teaching and that's we, that's what we do when we do our teaching. But when you're done, I mean, you have people like Bijoy that say, oh, I owe so much to you. And that, that you know, that, that feels good. But, but, but there's a lot of other times that it doesn't feel good. You feel like you've been, you, you, you haven't, they had all the fun and you just did the teaching even though you enjoy that part. And so we thought there should be a place within schools of architecture, and this is a kind of, a, a, a kind of an experiment, 
where the, the, the teachers and the students actually work together on real projects, but it's an educational setting. So it's not like, uh, you know, nine to five and so on. It, it's, uh, it's a different thing. So uh, we have, uh, some, sometimes we have real successes and sometimes it's harder. Uh, but anyways, it, it looks like this. Um, this is Zhao Cheng Di. Uh, one of the artists in the lives actually right next to us in a, a kind of Ai Weiwei compound. Um, Wong. Wang from last spring. Um, Valerie uh, is Wong's husband, uh, w a wife. Uh, taught a, a, a course in the sort of the history of contemporary Chinese art. Um, and we've tackled uh, several things, uh, the, the main project so far. One is uh, the urban villages. So we we've, 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 uh, we wrote a book about Chao Cheng Di, but we also put that topic on the on the map uh, for China, um, m well, in a small way. Um, and the second thing we, we started in on about four years ago, ch 700 million people in China live in rural villages. And if you look at them, they're very decent places to live. Uh, and and uh, at least the ones that we, we've been looking at, they're up in the mountains and they're, they're, they're fabulous. Uh, the air is great and so on and so forth. Um, but you wonder what the future is. Like, uh, people don't really have much employment. They grow their own food, uh, but, th but there's, no, there's no taxes and there's no, uh, uh, so th they own the buildings. They, they made the buildings. Um, but when people graduate from high school and, and graduate from college, they don't go back to the urban village. They go into the city um, and they get jobs. So the future of urban villages is, is bleak. Oh, excuse me, rural villages is bleak. You can't have, the way we look at it, you can't have 700 million people over the next 25 years move into the city. It's just, it would be the equivalent of building all the American cities twice over. You can't, it's not possible. And we also thought maybe, uh, maybe there's something wrong also with the notion that the city is the place to be and the rural landscape is not the place to be. Uh, and is there a way to reverse that? And, and how, can, how does architecture sort of find a, a way there? Um, and um, you, you won't see any evidence of, of, of how, we've, how we've gotten on this thing, but we, uh, we, we still believe in it and um, finding a way. And then, uh, then, the, then we have something called baseline uh, but this is an exaggerated version of a, of a coat. Uh, there's a little, there's a sewing factory near us with a, has about 50 people working uh, there. And uh, this is, uh, uh, when Rem Kohlhaus does the CCTV building, he steals, in a good way, the diagonal bracing of the, the cloth that protects the city from the building construction uh, as the facade of the CCTV. We took the cloth, not the bracing, and made it into a, it's basically a Mao jacket. Um, and then, and so we, we uh, Marianne teaches in the uh, University of Michigan, and, and she, uh, and they said, our, our, uh, the, the chair there said, you know, you have a budget of a, I don't know what it was, a thousand dollars for um, probably five hundred, six hundred dollars, something. Um, so every year we would have something made. Um, this was, I'll get back to this, this was um, one of the things we did. But we didn't, this is, uh, this is a welder's cap. Well, welders in China don't wear goggles. Uh, they, they should. 
to say the least. But they, they you know, it's, uh, they use their hands. You know, they sort of like peek through the things and then they turn the thing on and, and then they close the, the hand. Um, it, but they wear this. This protects their neck from the sparks. Uh, and the hand is protecting the face. And so we, and th these are about, you know, 50 cents each, um, made of scrap, uh, uh, scrap cloth. Uh, so it's, in a sense, recycling what's normally thrown away. And so all we did was put our label in it, baseline, and uh, a, a place here for um, the I iPod and a place here for, uh, I don't know, the cell phone. I don't know. Or this is your wallet. Who knows? Uh, one of the, but then we we thought, well, this isn't so bad. Um, if you, uh, we haven't tried this yet. Uh, like, I, if you got on the airplane wearing this, I'm not sure you'd get on the airplane. Um, it it doesn't. I'm not sure they'd allow you on. Although, it's not a liquid and it's not, you know, a bomb. Um, but on an airplane. This is good. This, this allows you to sleep. Um, and th so the, the coat we made a whole edition of, uh, small, medium, large, extra large, of course. And uh, then we, we did this thing that you see here, and you'll see one more. We, we went back to the factory. A woman was running it. And uh, this was, this is not that easy to sew. This is this cloth they use to cover buildings, again. They, they have the same stuff here. They, I, I think here it's not as nice, it's not this nice green. Um, so they, you know, said, okay, we'll do it. And, they, you know, they, I don't know, it's, they're like $2 each or something. And then, um, then we came to them and said, can you make one of these? This is uh, two feet. Ten times the size, so it's 20 feet high. That's kind of what we're looking at here. Uh, and the woman didn't say anything like, you're crazy. She just said, yeah, no problem. And uh, to the including, we didn't uh, play the thing through to really know. We, we get the thing, and they made buttons that were <laughs> this size, ten times the size. And, and they, they, just, they just did it, no problem. Uh, this was a, uh, one of the, uh, again, as part of this baseline thing, this is a chopstick stool, slightly stolen uh, by a couple of students from a thing they saw down in Shanghai, but it wasn't with chopsticks and these steamers. Uh, uh, so the chopsticks go down, but down about midway is a, uh, is a sort of a, the 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 seamers are cut out for the first two, but then the chopsticks hit the bottom of the thing. But there's some foam rubber in between, so you can sit on the thing and and uh, it's cushions your seat. And this is uh, one of the uh, rural villages, and uh, this is the main room in the house with a kong. Uh, they're all the same. The kitchen is in the middle of the house. The stove, you feed firewood in or coal. Uh, firewood's preferable. The smoke from the fire goes underneath the bed and out a chimney down the end. So the Kong, which is higher, see my feet are dangling. So your feet in the winter will never touch the ground and get cold. So you're, they're up off the ground. But you're sitting on a warm surface because the fire is, is sending the heat through the building. Th these things have been around forever. And that's the, um, the ten size uh, thing in the courtyard. And as I said, snippets of, of work, uh, what to do, what not to do. Um, and starting with that that 300,000 year old building, if it really was that old. Uh, look it up on the internet, you'll, you'll get the lowdown on it. Um, and then this is, a, is, a, is, a, is now an antique. This is one of the early chi chips, uh, probably from IBM. Um, 
or, or Intel. Um, and that, so we're bracketed, but we're mostly towards this end of the bracket with our work in architecture and this question about what to do, what not to do, or maybe what not to do is, uh, is, is, is uh, for me, it's the thing that's the most important uh, to, to have on the table and to be considering all the time. And I know, uh, I mean, well, for, at least for us, um, what to do is, is to uh, ma make your way in the world doing things that you'd like to do and you're having fun doing them as you're designing these buildings. Uh, uh, and in, in the, uh, I could, I don't need to talk more about this because I think all you need to do is, and you've done it, is go into the room where Bijoy has those things and, uh, and you'll see, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get that story. Um, and, and so the message is not that making things with your hands, drawing with your hand, is what to do. Uh, the message is to somehow internalize the, the situations out there and make them your own. And, and so if you're, uh, again, I, I tell our students, uh, if, you, if you're working in Maya, which most of the Sarek students do, so the buildings have very few flat surfaces, uh, uh, or, or Rhino, you capture it so that you take control of it, it doesn't take control of you. Uh, but uh, so that's, again, the sermon part. And that's uh, more to come in the future. Thank you.